أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our second week Can you hear me? Okay, very good, alhamdulillah So we'll start chapter 2 today, inshallah Chapter 2 has two topics Number 1 is the data processing cycle and number two business cycles and we're going to discuss the data processing cycle today and then we'll start the business cycles on Tuesday inshallah I need you to keep these two topics separate in your mind so that when you're asked a question about the data processing cycle you do not mix that up with the business cycles which we're going to discuss in our next class not today so we're going to solely dedicate our discussion to the data processing cycle in today's class the data processing cycle involves some basic concepts that we need to know and most of this you already know just a refresher Maybe one or two things uh, will be added to what you already know. The first one is data entry. All of you know what that means. You enter data in your phone all the time. You record new phone numbers. You record new contacts. So data entry is something that all of us do regularly. Uh, number two is data storage. Again, the same thing, just saving the data in any database it could be the computer the phone the tablet in the cloud so storing of the data number 3 organization of the data so the data is organized in some way either alphabetically or numerically or some other way so there is an uh, option of organizing the data many options actually of organizing the data after you have entered it number 4 updating data all of us know what that is modifying the data either adding or deleting or changing number five retrieval of data so if you have the data already in entered into the system or the database looking at that data retrieving the data either printing it or looking at it on your screen <clears throat> so that's retrieval of data and number six access to the data now the access to the data depends on your role in in the organization so for example when I enter the grades of all of you in blackboard you only have access to your grade and not the grades of the other students so the data access is limited it's restricted on the other hand you can look at all of your grades in all the classes but I can only look at your grade in the AIS class. So we have all restricted access or on our function in the organization. So these are some big introductory concepts that will come in handy as we discuss the data processing cycle. And I'm going to continue. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask me you can stop me and ask me if you have questions okay can you hear me okay I think there's some issue going on with the recording. Okay, there it is. Now we have the uh, the data. Uh, processing cycle 
let me see you're saying the voice is not clear or it's lagging a little bit let me see All right, how about now? Is it clear? Okay, very good. So we, we are in the uh, next slide about the data processing cycle. There are uh, four steps in the data processing cycle. The data processing cycle could be computerized. It could also be manual. So you could do it with the sophisticated computerized system or you could do it with paper and pencil. The data processing itself is older than the concept of computers, right? So we have the computers now, and that's why we use them for processing the data. But even if we did not have the computers, we could still process the data without any without any problems. There are four steps in the data processing cycle. Data input is very self-explanatory, entering the data. Data processing, data storage, and data output. The processing and storage can come one before the other or one after the other. So you could enter data and then you could process the data. For example, you can add, subtract, multiply, or do something to the data, and then you could store it. Or you could enter the data, store it, and later you could process it, right? And then you can produce the output. The output can be hard copy, or it could be uh, on a screen somewhere. It could be an electronic copy. So these are the four steps in the data processing cycle. And we're going to discuss each one of these steps in further detail. Let's start with the first one. We're going to discuss what type of data we're going to come, it will come in, in, in next, inshallah. So the data that we input relates to uh, three different aspects as we briefly introduced last week resources, events, and agents. Can you give me some examples of resources? When I, when I say we input data about resources, some examples of resources, what do we mean when we say resources? Examples? Anyone? Raw material, okay, very good. What else? Asset, very good. What type of assets? Give me some more concrete examples. Information is what we are entering, right? So we are talking about, information is definitely a resource, but here we are entering the data to process the information about other resources. So for example, computers, buildings, right? Computers, buildings, lands, uh, desks, furniture, all of these things are resources, tangible assets. It could be intangible assets as well, right? So resources, things that we use in the business. We also enter data about events. So give me some examples of events. What do we mean uh, by in, uh, events? Right. Tangible as well as intangible, right? Uh, events, sale, right? Sale is an event. What we are doing right now is an event, right? What is happening right now? We are conducting a session, right? A class. It's an event, right? 
So the events in an organization are things that take place, right? Any incident, any incident is an event, right? The third is agents. Agents are people involved in those events. For example, customers, managers, salespeople, employees, students, teachers, cleaners, anybody who's involved in those events are agents. So we enter data about these three different aspects of the business. The data input can be enhanced in a few different ways. Number one, automatically generated sequential numbering. You know when you go to the traffic department or the hospital or um, you have uh, gone to the immigration office, you sit there and you get a number, right? from the, uh, Hamad as an example, those small tickets that you get, those are automatically generated sequential numbers. So your number is called and then when you go to the counter, your data is entered, right? So it helps organize the input of the data so that all customers are not coming to the cup at the same time. You get the ticket, you get the sequential number and you wait until your turn comes and you go and they enter the data, right? That's number one. Number two, using turnaround documents. What does a turnaround document mean? Let's take a look at an example. Uh, Omar has a question. How does this improve the data? It does not improve the data. It, it enhances the process of inputting the data so if you have five customers standing at the counter it harms your input of the data you want one at a time to enter the data so it helps you improve the input of the data the data is the same it helps the input of the data is that clear Omar okay now here we have something called a turnaround document. You see this is a Kahrama bill and it has two parts. It has this top part and you have this bottom part right here. There is a perforation which you can cut right here along this line. There is a barcode at the bottom part and there is a barcode at the top part. So what I was supposed to do was I was supposed to cut this bottom part and send this bottom part back with the payment. So when they got my bill, the check that I would write with this bill, they would get that and then this bottom part and then they would scan this which would bring my customer number and it would help them input the payment data into their system. This is, this is called a turnaround document. A turnaround document means that the company or the organization, Kahrama, sent me this document and I turned around and I sent a part of this back to them with the payment so that when they input payment data, they can do it more efficiently. Instead of entering my name or my account number, they could just scan this barcode and it would help them input the data more accurately and more efficiently. So a turnaround document is a document that comes to the customer and the customer sends it back or part of it back so that the organization can enter the data more efficiently, input the data more efficiently. This example that I just gave, this is an example of a turnaround document which is number two in our slide and the example that I shared with you it's called a remittance advice so remittance advice is notification of payment so when I made the payment I send that piece of paper back and that is called a remittance advice there could be 
other documents that are turned around documents as well. For example, if I gave you a survey to complete and you completed it, you entered your name, your ID, your phone number, and answered some questions, and you gave it back to me, then that would also be another example of a turnaround document. Turnaround doc document is something that comes to you and you turn it around and you send it back and that is used to enter the data or input the data. Is that clear? The turnaround document? Okay, very good. Number three is source data automation. Source data automation means the transaction is updated and input as the source of the transaction. For example, the ATM machine. When you go to the ATM machine and you take money out, the ATM machine prints out a receipt that shows your bank balance. Is that balance before you took the money or after you took the money? It's after you took the money, right? Very good. That means the updating of your account happens right there at the source of the transaction. The computer automatically inputs that amount into your account and it reduces the balance and produces the new balance instantly. So it's called a source data automation system. The data is automated the updating of the data, the input of the data is done at the source instantly. This is an example of a source data automation. Another example of the source data automation is the POS. POS stands for point of sale. Point of sale is the system that supermarkets such as Lulu and Carrefour and Almira, they have the point of sale is the cash register. When they scan the item that you purchased, it not only adds that amount to your bill, but it reduces that item from the inventory. So for example, let's say you bought an iPhone and they had 10 sets uh, of phones before you purchased it. As soon as they scan in the inventory now, the number of iPhones would be reduced from 10 to 9. So it instantly inputs the data that there was a sale and now the new number of sets available, iPhone sets available, uh, uh, is no longer 10, it's 9. And it also adds to your bill. So this is also another example of source data automation and POS stands for point of sale. So this is updated as at the point of sale. As soon as the sale takes place, this, the bill is updated for the customer and the inventory is updated for the company that is selling the item. Is that clear? Okay, very good. Number four, data entry screens. Data entry screens, I don't have to tell you, you have multiple in front of your uh, each one of your uh, uh, eyes, you have your phone, you have your tablet, and if you go to uh, restaurants and, and, and supermarkets such as Lulu, Carrefour, or McDonald's, Papa John's, they have the data entry screens where they can input the data without the help of a keyboard, and it helps process the entering of the data. It makes it more efficient uh, rather than using a keyboard, right? Number five, uh, transaction verification, which also happens at the uh, place where the data is input. So you get, for example, when, once the data is updated in the ATM machine, you get not only a receipt, but you get a uh, text message that says that such, amount, such and such amount of money was withdrawn from such and such ATM machine, let's say the ATM machine in Lulu or ATM machine in, in Villaggio, and your account is now updated, right? So the transaction verification is also uh, helpful when the data is input. 
right so you know the data was entered or it's it, it serves actually multiple purposes the example that I gave you it is also a security measure when if somebody takes money out of your bank account you would know that it was uh, someone else if it was not you right uh, Hamad uh, has typed the sign in what do you, what do you mean by that when you say the sign in this is a uh, to, to relate it to number four or number five? Hamad and Naimi? The sign in into what? Okay, so data entry screen is not any verification. It's just the convenience of the of the data entry screen, right? When you're entering data, so your touch screen helps you enter the data easier. So if you go to McDonald's and you have that that electronic ordering system, you can touch the the picture of the hamburger or the ice cream, and it's ordered instead of you uh, typing using a keyboard or using uh, any other method so that's the data entry screen helps you that way the verification right for example when you're entering uh, into a website Hamad is giving the example uh, the entering the the blackboard and you're getting like a code to enter right that is something else that is a security measure Transaction verification is uh, a message that is sent to you, for example, by Amazon once your order is input into their system. So you get an email, right, that says that your uh, order has been shipped or your order has been placed, right? The one-time password, the OTP is not a transaction version for the purpose of a transaction. It is just a security measure, more so, right? The message that you get once either you have placed an order or it has been shipped, that means your data or your order has been input into the system, right? and then you get a message saying that your order has been placed or it is entered into the system or sh your shipment has been placed right so this is a verification of that transaction something that you wanted to do something that you did and the data related to that has been input into the system right so that's the transaction verification is that clear okay very good Let's move on to the next uh, next slide. Right, how much is examples? Amazon and carriage, right? Very good. Uh, the next is data storage. Uh, we need the data to be organized in order for us to retrieve the data. And you would see sometimes somebody opens up their computer and there are all files all over the screen. You have Word and Excel and other folders and so forth. Uh, all over the place and the data is not very organized and it's difficult to find the data if it is not organized so uh, you need a method of organizing the data and it is easier to find and it is efficient to find if you have the data organized so you might have some someone who's got a folder that says uh, fall 2020 then in in that folder you will find a folder for AIS inside that folder you you're going to find a folder that says slides another one that says exams another one that says projects you open the slides you'll find chapter one two three four you open the project folder you will find project A project B etc so if it is organized it's easy to find and use the data later uh, there are certain terminologies that we use in accounting to organize the data the first one is a ledger. A ledger, you know, all of you have seen this. Uh, it's, for example, a T account. You know, all of you have 
looked at a T account when you took a financial the financial exam uh, financial accounting class you have a, a debit column and a credit column and you have a T account for each one of the uh, accounts so you have a cash T account you have an accounts receivable T account right so this is an example of a ledger where you input the data and you store it in the ledger number two is a general ledger which is the summary of each account uh, let me show you one This is a general ledger, as you see. Uh, we have the summary of each account. So we have inventory, and then we have accounts receivable for each one of the customers. We have the people's bank account, and then we have machine and equipment and furniture. We have accumulated depreciation. So this is a general ledger where you have the summarized debits and credits for each account. Okay, so this is called a general ledger. The next one in the slide is a subsidiary ledger. A subsidiary ledger is a further detail about a particular account. So here, this company has an accounts receivable which includes all of the customer's accounts receivable, but it also has one accounts receivable for each customer. So you have accounts receivable North Supermarket, accounts receivable West Supermarket. Each one of these individual accounts receivables are called a subsidiary ledger, a subsidiary ledger, which is a breakdown of one particular account into further accounts based on your need. So you want to keep track of the accounts receivable from each one of your customers and you have an accounts receivable subsidiary ledger for each one of these customers okay so here going back to our slide we had the ledger which is the t account general ledger which is the document that i showed you and then we have a subsidiary ledger which is an individual accounts receivable for each one of the customers right that is an example of a subsidiary ledger you can have an accounts payable for each one of your suppliers and that would also be an example of a subsidiary ledger so far so good the first three ledger general ledger and subsidiary ledger okay now we have number four which is a chart of accounts the difference between Omar has a question the difference between a ledger and a subsidiary ledger is let's go back and Go back to the general ledger. So here we have, let's say here, Omar, we have, you see this accounts payable, this accounts payable account. This is, there is a T account for accounts payable, right, Omar? There is a T account for this accounts payable that would be a ledger, which would have all the accounts payable debit cents. But if we break this accounts payable down by each supplier, accounts payable, water company accounts payable, office supply company accounts payable, uh, soap and shampoo company, that would be a subsidiary ledger. Each one of them would be a sub ledger, a subsidiary ledger breakdown of this ledger that we have, we call accounts payable. Is that clear? If we combined all of these accounts receivable into one, accounts receivable T account that would be an example of a general a ledger by itself and then when we break it down by each customer it is an example of a subsidiary ledger is that clear okay the next 
item we have is a chart of accounts okay a chart of accounts chart of accounts is a list of all the accounts the company uses by uh, name and account number so let me show you an example the chart of accounts here is a chart of accounts so you see this this company has all of these accounts that it uses as you see it has every single account has an account number and it has an account name so everybody is entering the items for example prepaid supplies the account number is 2110000 and the description is prepaid supplies. So everybody entering and storing data about prepaid supplies is entering into the same account and storing into the same account. So it helps in organizing the data related to prepaid supplies into this one account. Okay. Uh, the next. data storage terminology is a transaction journal a transaction journal is where all the uh, journal entries are recorded so you know the journal entries are uh, recorded with debits and credits to each account about each purchase sale depreciation uh, all the transactions that take place and the place where the journal entries are recorded is called a transaction journal. They usually have a beginning date and they usually have an end date. So you can record all the transactions for the month of August into the transaction journal of August. And number six is an audit trail. An audit trail is some type of method of keeping track of the transactions so that if something goes wrong in the future or you need to know more information about a particular transaction you have certain details that are associated with a particular transaction and it will help you find the transaction details later for example let's say you go to the supermarket and you buy a few items and you leave one of the bags at the counter you forget to take one of the bags and it has some items and you get a receipt and you come home and you find that the bag with the bread and the milk was left you forgot to bring it if you go back right they have that bread and milk and they stored it back into their shelves but they have recorded in their uh, database that uh, at 10 a.m. or 10.04 a.m. customer at counter number 6 left the milk and the bread. So you bring back the receipt and you show that I did not take this milk and bread. They will look at that receipt. The receipt will have the details. It will have the cashier's name it will have the time it will have the date it will have the counter number all of this information is called audit trail it it helps them trace back the transaction and they can give you because they know that you are the customer that left the milk and the bread and not uh, any other customer can come and do that uh, same happens when you return something when you go back to return an item uh, they ask you to bring the receipt. Why? Because it has all the details about the item you purchased. The barcode is scanned uh, using the barcode in that box. So they have all that detail. So it helps them look at the data with the audit trail. Is that clear? 
the concept of audit trail. Are you following? Okay, very good. Any questions about any one of these in the data storage before we move along? Uh, Sharat says that is it like a transaction ID? Transaction ID is one of the ways of keeping the audit trail. Transaction ID, the name of the salesperson, the time of the transaction, the number of the uh, the, uh, the the uh, counter, all of these things are audit trails. So the transaction ID is one audit trail. Okay, very good. Let's go to the next uh, slide. There are uh, different ways of organizing the data that you have stored, uh, coding the data. The first one is called a sequence code. A sequence code is serial numbers uh, given to documents so that you can trace them uh, after you have used them. For example, checks have serial numbers, sequence numbers. 1001, 1002, 1003. Invoices have uh, sequence numbers like 501, 502, 503. These help you store the data about those transactions using those sequence numbers, sequence codes. And this is the easiest one to understand. The second one is block code. Block code is used to identify the data. Let's uh, try to understand this with an example. If we were to meet face to face, if this class was face to face, can anyone tell us which room we would meet at? What would be the room number where this class was supposed to be face to face? Anyone? Anyone knows the room number of this class? E203, Hamad, excellent, E203. Outstanding. Now, when I say 203, which floor is that classroom in? Bottom floor or top floor? 203, top floor, right? Can a room number in the bottom floor be a 200 number? Can it be 203 or 205, 210? Is it possible? No, right? That means the 200 is blocked for the top floor and the 100 is blocked for the bottom floor. So anytime we number a room in the top floor, it will be with the 200. Anytime we number a floor in the bottom floor, it would be with 100. Another example, let's say, Qatar has a country code. When you call Qatar from outside, what is the what are the three digits that you must dial to call Qatar from outside? 974, right? So this is blocked for 974. All numbers beginning with 974 will come to Qatar and it will not go to any other GCC country, right? It would come here now or any other country, not just GCC. So this is block code. You have blocked a particular code, a set of numbers, or it could be alphabets as well, for a particular purpose. Is that clear when you're coding data? Okay. It could be used for products. It could be used for student numbers. It could be used for customer numbers. It could be used for inventory items. It could be used for assets. It could be used for anything. Is that clear? Block codes. The next one is group codes. A group code is a set of two or more block codes. Now, one more time, our room number, which is empty right now, or maybe somebody else is having a party there, we don't know. What is our room number where we're supposed to meet? One more time. E, mm, that's not the right, 203, there you go, E203. Now, we have, we have two blocks, right? We have two blocks. One is E, and the other one is 203, 
right? We have and we have two zero three. Now uh, e is one block and two zero three is another block. When we say e, it means the room is in the e section, right? And Hamad is typing d. That means if you have d at the beginning of the room number, that means that room is in the d block. So we have two block codes here. The first is the alphabet, and the second one is the hundred or two hundred. So e tells us or D tells us that it's in the E or D block and 203 tells us that it is in the top floor right so these two right these two put together we have a group code we have two blocks now I'm going to give you a very very complicated group code and let me see if you know what it means what does this group code mean The date, right? Today's date. Very good. But it's rather complicated because there are many rules about this group code. The first block, what is the maximum number you can have in that first block? What is the highest number you're allowed to put in this? The first block. First block. First block. Guys. Okay. Very good. 12. The second block, what is the highest? 31 very good so what is the minimum in the second block one you cannot put zero can you right you cannot put zero right you cannot put zero now one is the minimum and 31 is the maximum so there is a method of doing the coding right there is a method of doing the coding and uh, everybody should know the method otherwise when you're entering and reading someone else's code you would not know what it means Hamada Naimi said the last one Allah knows of course uh, however what is the maximum number using the code that we use right now the maximum number that we can use right now the year uh, 99 what does that mean 99 for example if we were to do four digits 2020 right the maximum we can do is 99.99 right if we have uh, our uh, great 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 grandchildren's great great grandchildren's great great grandchildren's great great grandchildren if they ever get to year 10,000 then it would have to go to five digits the four digits will not do right but we don't have to worry about it right we are not even going to get to 29.99 so or any one of us here right in this class we would not get to 29.99 so we don't have to worry about that now you understand the idea about the group code right block code and group code that's clear yes is it clear okay very good. Let's move on to the next. We have the following things that are important related to uh, the data storage. The first one is consistency with intended use. So we need to be consistent with what we want to use it for. So if we want to use it for phone numbers or you want to use it for room numbers, we want, want to use it for product numbers, we need to do it with the intention of what we want to accomplish and uh, in our case in the you know a, we have blocks and we have floors so we have 
named our blocks A, B, C, D, E, and we have numbered our rooms 100 and 200. So this is consistent in all, all floors and all blocks based on our need. Number two, it has to allow for growth. So the maximum number of rooms we can have in each floor now is 100. So we can number our rooms from 100 to 199 in the first floor and from 200 to 299 in the second floor or the top floor. And the maximum number of rooms we can have is 100 in each floor, in each block. But if we wanted to have more than 100 rooms in each block, then three digits would not do. You would have to go to then 1,000 to 1,999 and 2,000 to 2,999 if we wanted more than 100 rooms. So if we wanted uh, the allowance for growth, in our case, in our building, we don't have space for even 100 rooms. So we have enough space to, to give numbers if we were to split even a room into two and we can name number them uh, accordingly. So with, with this, it, it allows you to grow the number of rooms. With the use of 100, you can only go up to ninth floor. If you want to go to the tenth floor, you have to go to the thousands. So this allows you for growth, the numbering that you give, you look at what you need and you keep room so that you can grow the numbers. Number three, it is, uh, it should be simple. So we need to keep it simple to minimize errors and minimize cost. Uh, this, is, this is easy to uh, use and, and train. So we need to make sure that our coding is simple so that we can train the new uh, employees or new um, individuals joining the organization and people using it don't make mistakes as it is not complicated, right? If it is uh, complicated, then more mistakes might happen. And number four, it has to be consistent throughout the organization. For example, we have another example of a group code here. You see ACCT421, which is the number for this class. ACCT, the first four letters, stand for accounting, and 421 is the number of the class, which is a fourth year class. So we have 100, 200, 300, and 400 indicating which year this class is, and then the four letters indicate the subject. And this is exactly the same no matter which department or college you go to inside the university. Go to the College of Arts and Sciences or Engineering or Pharmacy or Medicine or uh, Chemistry. It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same, right? So this is consistent throughout the organization so that you, once you learn, uh, you can use it in any department you go to. Is that clear? This point number four, it has to be consistent throughout the organization, right? If you, if you have difficulty, please uh, stop and ask me, and I'm going to continue assuming you understand, inshallah. The next uh, slide talks about uh, a, a few more concepts that relate to the storage of the data. Number one is entity. Entity is the subject or the item about which you're entering data. So let's say we have, uh, think of this data storage as a table, right? As a, a, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, let's say. We're entering data in this storage, which is an Excel spreadsheet. Now, let's say we are entering data about students. So the entity is going to be the student. Number two, attributes. Any quality or information about the entity is called an attribute. So the student's phone number or the student's ID number or the student's date of birth is an attribute. All of these are examples of attributes of the entity, which is the student. Number three, a record. A record is 
a row so think of this table and there is a row in that row you have all the attributes of one particular student so you have student X the date of birth of student X the nationality of student X the midterm grade for student X the average uh, the cumulative GPA of student X this whole row going from left to right is a record of student X number four is a uh, is a field which is the column which has all the same attributes for all of the entities so for example if we have a column that is called the phone number column everybody's phone number from top to bottom is included in that field in that column in Excel the columns are numbered how are the alphabets or, or numbers in Excel think about the Excel spreadsheet are they columns uh, are the alphabets or numbers the columns top to bottom alphabets right a b c d very good and then the rows are numbers right one two three four are you following so we have the columns that are alphabets and we have the rows that are numbers so we can say when we say go to box uh, C5 that means that is the intersection of column C and row 5 C5 and in that there is a data value right in the intersection of a column and a row so I, I, if I ask you to tell me the data value of C5 that means you will tell me whatever is in the C5 maybe this is the phone number of student X or the date of birth of student X so one particular piece of data the data value is in this box which is the intersection of one column and one row is that clear as the data value that one small piece of data number six is a file this entire spreadsheet is called a file number seven master file master file is a file which is more permanent in nature so for example if we have a master file we would have information uh, about students such as their name their date of birth their home phone number their home address their nationality master file data usually do not change and if they change they don't change regularly for example you have the students date of birth which would never change you have the students home address which can change if the student changes uh, the, the location but it is not something that changes regularly so the master file data is more permanent in nature right they don't change regularly or they do, don't change at all Similarly, you can have a master file about employees, same, their name, their date of birth, their, their, their home address, their home phone number, nationality, etc. They, they do not change at all or do not change regularly. Number eight is a transaction file. A transaction file is where transactions are recorded for a period of time. So, for example, you might have a sales file, sales transaction file for the month of August and all the sales are recorded from 1st of August until 31st of August and then when September begins you would have another transaction file for September your grades for example the spring 2020 is now closed any course you register for now is no longer going to be added to your spring 2020 uh, grade it will be added to your cumulative but it will show up under 2020 fall right and once 2020 fall finishes again it would be 2021 spring inshallah so transaction file has beginning and end and it is for that period of time any transaction that is recorded the last one is database which is a combination of many many files in the database and they are somehow connected and related 
and we are going to discuss this in, in much more detail in chapter 4 which relates to databases inshallah right so this is just an introduction to these terminologies and we're going to go into more details in chapter 4 so far so good okay now we go to the next data processing the data processing uh, is fairly simple uh, number one adding data there's no explanation needed you know adding more data viewing the data right opening the file and looking at the data number three updating the data making changes adding deleting modifying the data and number four deleting the data again simple to understand in the updating of the data we have three different types of updates and we're going to discuss them one by one the first one is batch processing batch processing of data involves taking a set of files or data and processing them or updating them together without doing them individually so for example let's say I give you an exam and you're sitting in the class and I give you two hours to complete the exam let's say a student completes in 40 minutes and submits the paper and I put it aside and I store it I keep it another one finishes after an hour I keep it a few more finishes after an hour and a half I keep all the exams until everybody finishes and I grade all of them together after everyone is done and I post them in blackboard all at once this is called batch processing everything is processed together in batches going to the third one online real-time processing is let's say you're taking a quiz in blackboard and as soon as you individually finish taking the quiz and you submit and you click OK immediately your quiz will be graded while some other students could be taking the exam so it will not wait for them to finish it will process online real time and it will give you the grade so instantly is that clear the online real time compared to the batch right so the first one and the third one let me know if you if you have any difficulty coming back to the one in the middle it is hybrid it's somewhere in between so let's say you're taking the exam in class and you're bringing the exam to me as soon as you're done I grade the exam as soon as you submit I grade the exam but I do not post it in blackboard until all the students have finished and I have finished grading all of them so part of it I do immediately as soon as you bring me the exam I grade it but the other part posting all the grades to blackboard I do all at once in batch so there is part of it is online and part of it is batch I could set the blackboard is to do online batch processing as well so it will grade your exam immediately but it will not show it to you it will wait until the exam time has finished and everybody has submitted and then it will show you so it could be part of it could be processed immediately after you submit and part of it could be processed in a, a batch processing uh, system is that clear online batch processing part of it is immediate a part of it is in batches okay so these are the three different ways of updating the data updating you have a question Hamad okay very good now we go to the next we have a couple of more slides and we'll finish inshallah maybe a few minutes early uh, information output 
could be on the screen or it could be a hard copy output. The first one here we have uh, documents, for example, an invoice or a bill, right? It shows, it proves that you have purchased or sold something. It proves the transaction. So a document uh, provides evidence of a transaction or some something else event. For example, your ID is a document. It proves your uh, residency or citizenship, right? So a document, it's an output. Number two, reports. Reports are a more comprehensive output. For example, a direct labor report or let's say your uh, transcript which shows all of your grades from the beginning of, of your journey as a, as a university student until now. So it has a comprehensive uh, list of all the courses and the grades and the, and the, and the semesters. So reports are more comprehensive. The example here is the direct labor report which shows all the details about the direct laborers in a company. And there could be many, many, many different types of reports. Number three are queries, uh, for example, total overtime hours. So if you have a small question or a small query, you want to know something that is uh, a small bit of information, then that is called a query. So for example, let's say a few weeks from now, after we have our quizzes, one of you wants to know what was your quiz in the first, what was your grade in the first quiz, uh, that would be an example of a query. Or if you wanted to know how many days have I been absent, then that is a query, right? So small piece of information or a small piece of data that uh, you request, it's called a query. So we have documents, we have reports, and we have queries. Okay. Moving along, the use of these outputs, it helps us, number one, in planning. For example, budgets, if you have budgets, and all of you have looked at budgets, if you remember, in your managerial accounting class, uh, sales budget, raw materials budget, production budget. Do you remember any of that? Do you remember that in your managerial class? Any one of you? Managerial is a prerequisite, right, of this class, remember? So what that does is it helps you plan how much am I going to sell or how much am I going to produce so that I can buy the, the right amount of raw material, etc. So it helps in planning. It also helps in day-to-day -day management, for example, delivery schedule. So if you know uh, the output or the data about when the truck with the milk with, will come and when the, the, the truck with the fruits and vegetables would come, then you can arrange for people to uh, unload those trucks uh, and it helps you in your day-to-day -day management of your business. Number three, controlling your operations. So for example, uh, comparing your budget with the actual helps you control your operations. So let's say you wanted to have a certain amount of raw material used and you find that you're having uh, a lot of waste and your raw material that you budgeted is, is not going to be enough. So you might order more and you might look into why uh, there is waste, who's wasting, etc., etc. So you can control your operations by having these outputs, these reports that the system generates. And number four, evaluation of your performance. So you can get uh, data such as customer surveys or you can get the data about error rates and you can see how good or bad your performance is based on these outputs, these reports that the system generates for you. It's pretty simple uh, to understand, I believe. Any, any difficulty in understanding this? Do, do you understand the use of the output, the benefit of the the reports and the queries and the documents clear yes no maybe okay very good last slide for today Hamad says like the Sun I like that uh, 
Uh, Atif says, how's day-to-day -day management relates to information output? The output helps you manage your business. So the budget is an example of an output or the direct labor report is an example of an output or the overtime report is an example of an output and it helps you control and plan and manage your operations, right? So if you have too much waste, the waste report would show that and you can try to stop that. If you have too much overtime, you can try to stop that. You have too many people absent, you can try to uh, control that, right? Uh, with the output, we can get feedback with it too. Yes, feedback is also another type of output, right? So, uh, for example, at the end of this semester, uh, last semester, I, I know we did not do it, but regularly you have the opportunity to fill out the course evaluation, which tells us how the course was for you. And this is feedback. This is an output from, from the data that you enter into the system. And it, it helps each instructor plan the course in the following semester. If there was something that the, that the students had difficulty with, with, then the instructor could fix it. Does that Make sense, Atif? Yeah, Hamad, is that clear? Okay. Now, the last slide, we have the role of AIS. The traditional accounting information system used to only gather financial data about the, the uh, money and the purchase and the sale but now we have sophisticated systems we call them enterprise resource planning softwares enterprise resource planning softwares like SAP or Oracle this helps us keep track of both financial as well as non-financial data what that does for us is not only are we looking at how many sandwiches we sold we can keep track of how many chicken sandwiches we sold for lunch and how many fish sandwiches we sold for lunch and we can see whether people prefer more uh, fish sandwiches more or, or chicken sandwiches more for lunch and we can use that data in our uh, in our operations to prepare more of the kind that the customers want. If we ran short, if we ran out, then we can keep track of that data as well that the customer asked for this item and we don't, we didn't have it. So we can order more and we can have it ready next time the customer needs the item. So this helps us keep track of this information in a more sophisticated way, not just the purchase and the sale and the numbers uh, that relate to money, but about the operations as well right uh, so we have and we are going to use one inshallah in this course we're going to use one to record uh, and process data inshallah and I'm going to introduce you in a few weeks to the to the uh, software and we'll use it inshallah all right so this is uh, uh, enough for today inshallah is there any question or are there any other questions anything else you need uh, me to explain further or any comments? Everything good? Okay. Inshallah, I will see you again in this session on Tuesday at 3.30, inshallah. Hamad says, I mean, if I revise this and I found something confusing, could I send you an email? Of course, inshallah. Anytime you can send me an email if you have any questions or, or, or uh, anything you need my help with. Anytime, inshallah. Okay? Thank you so much. I will see you all again in this session on Tuesday. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.